Okay. All right. Is this working now? Excellent. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, uh, thank you for taking the time to come uh, on Thursday. I know you're probably tired of a couple of days of OpenStack Summit. Uh, we're going to be talking about service discovery and registration and microservices and um, all these sets. Fawad, do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, for the session. Uh, my name is uh, Fawad Khalik, and uh, I'm an engineer at PlumGrid, and uh, I've been involved in the OpenStack community for uh, a few years now, and I'm looking at containers and microservices and the area of uh, specifically uh, service registration and discovery these days. And we'll go over some of the uh, you know, points in that. Um. OK, and my name is Fernando Sanchez. I work for Mesosphere. We're the makers of the data center operating system, or the COS, which is open source and runs beautifully in OpenStack. So if you guys uh, want to give it a try, fire up some VMs in Nova and check out our website. And it's free and open source, so you probably like it. So what we're going to be covering today is we want to discuss service discovery and registration. And uh, this is a really, this topic is older than most people think. So we figured out that we divide the talk in two pieces and maybe give first an introduction, a historical view of where the problem is coming from and how this has been approached pretty much since the last 40 years, um, since the internet was born really. And then after understanding the problem, how it has been evolving across the years until we got into virtualization and containers and microservices, then take a little bit of uh, the discussion on the second piece of the tools that are available, the different approaches that are available to solve it today. Um, and also, what does this mean for OpenStack? Um, how does OpenStack, how does this uh, fit in an OpenStack environment? Are there any solutions available? What is missing? What is there? Things like that. We have a lot of slides, so I'm going to try to kind of go uh, quick through them and uh, let's see. Okay, so first of all, the history part and a disclaimer. Um, we wanted to provide context about what this is and where it's coming from. So we figured out we had to go way back, actually way back. Uh, when you go way back on, on, uh, on what you have in your memory, sometimes it turns out to be a little bit historically inaccurate. And a bit barry, so I figured out to put a disclaimer or even a bigger disclaimer. Uh, if you guys are going to Google everything that it's in here, probably some dates and some years will be here and there. The other thing that happens is this actually shows that some of us network engineers are actually older than we believe because when you start going back in time to the, the first time that you learned about these things, you find that, that you're actually becoming kind of an old man. Uh, so if anyone in the audience knows what a V92 modem is, be advised you're probably going to feel as old as I felt doing this presentation. So let's go back in history. Let's go back to history a long time back uh, in the very, very, very early days when the internet and data communications were being born. And if we go back to even the 80s, uh, the times when applications were living on a physical server, probably physical servers were looking at something like this. If anyone remembers that, you've probably been here longer than most. And in these times, if you had the luck to have a computer at home, we would probably be looking at something like this. And for those that you don't know, that thing in there used to be the first internet browser out there in CSA Mosaic. Um, if you were lucky enough to have a thing connected to the internet, probably you were using something like that. And, and it was probably heavy and noisy, and it used was using your friendly network provider to connect through a phone line or through an X25 line or through something like that to your application. But the point is, your application and the endpoint where you were reaching it had a one-to-one -one relationship. So when you want to get to your application, the service discovery piece of it is how do I get to the address where my application is with the name of the application, as easy as that. If your application had an IP address, which is where you want to get to it, basically the service discovery piece is just DNS. Where is my application? Give me an IP address and I get to it. Uh, that's how I get to my application from there. At this point in time, I was a really, old, a really young kid in Spain, so probably my, my mission critical application in this time would be something like this. That's what I wanted to get to. But the point is, I just had to go straight from one destination, from one name to one destination. Now, as we go past in time, probably this thing of having one application in a single server was not very scalable, right? So we had to have many physical servers that probably at this point in time did look a little bit like that. Um, I just had a, one of those shiny computers at that point in time, and probably I was running something like Netscape in those days. The point is, oh, using my V92 modem to connect. That was great. And my friendly network provider, which had changed the logo by then. 
the thing is I had one application living in many physical servers. So now I can, I, I need to find a way to actually find the right endpoint. And I'm probably going to need something like a load balancer, which is a, one of the keys to the story. Now I need something that translates to one address, to many addresses, to the address that I get, to the endpoints where this application has been implemented. Well, that load balancer probably did look at this point in time something like that. But uh, the point is, when my application reaches the IP address that the DNS gives me, the service discovery, now actually the application is going to be delivered in a different backend, in a different backend, not the one that I'm reaching. So the load balancer is going to be the middleman between the point where I get with my IP address and the backend implemented application. I was a little bit older here, so probably my business critical application for my Spanish guy, well, it was probably still the same thing. But um, if I get another request to that IP address, my load balancer is going to be the broker between the IP address that I'm getting in the load balancer from the DNS and the backend implementing it. So that's another key. How does the load balancer do with the service registration? How does the load, bal how does the load balancer know which are the backends implementing the service? Well, in these times, probably there was a guy that was programming the load balancer. Someone would get into the load balancer, would configure the load balancer, would manually program all the backends that were implementing that application. So probably that guy had some sort of vendor certification and manually would log into that load balancer. So when I added a new backend, a new physical server, he would go in here, program the load balancer, add a new configuration for the same backend so that when I get to the load balancer again, I will get to my application once again. So how is this manageable? Well, it was manageable because we had physical servers. We didn't have so much churn. It didn't change that much. And they, they were not growing and shrinking too, too fast, so it was manageable. We could add some scripts maybe to the load balancer, but it was probably not automated enough. Now, some, moving some years forward in the late 90s, early 2000s, the three-tier architecture comes in. Now our applications are divided now in three pieces. We have a web application, we have a web front end, we have the application itself and some database backend. So what does that mean for service registration? I had a laptop at that point in time and I was probably running something like the early versions of Safari. That means that instead of having single servers running my application, I probably have three tiers. I have a web tier in the front end, I have an application tier in the middle, I have a backend tier um, uh, with, with the database. I was connecting probably with some sort of cable modem through my friendly network provider, which changed the logo again. And what that means is, is now I need service discovery and registration in three pieces, in three different layers. So it's the same problem all over again. I need to load balance between an endpoint for the front end and the different front ends, an endpoint for the application and the different backends for the application, and an endpoint for the database and the different backend for the database. So again, I need a load balancer in each one of these layers. So that every time I hit my load balancer, it will go to the front end, one of them, it will go to the application, one of them, it will go to the database, I will get the information that I need, back to the application, and finally, I get to my business critical application um, that, that I need to see, and I get my fix for it. So as you guys can see, things are getting increasingly complex as we move through the years, because we're getting, I do it dividing and conquer, but we're also increasing complexity in where are my services living and where am I offering them to the consumers. So what happens when we don't, have, we don't even have physical servers? Time moves forward, we're in the early 2000s, we are now doing everything virtualized. We don't even know where our servers are. We cannot know physically where they are. What that means is I can have web application database servers created and destroyed in minutes. I'm running maybe OpenStack, I'm running maybe VMware, and I'm creating my application servers, my, my database servers, and my business critical front-end application servers, uh, pretty much anywhere in my in my uh, commodity servers. What that means is my applications can also can scale up and down dynamically and much faster. I'm not bringing in physical servers and creating VMs, destroying VMs, so they can be increasing, they can be growing, they can be shrinking. What that means is we cannot configure things manually anymore. I cannot go into a load balancer and add a new backend and add a new HE proxy configuration every time that a VM comes in. It becomes unbearable, it becomes, yeah, I can deal with that. So we need a, an automated way for these things to basically register themselves and offer themselves to other consumers. And the different, op the different options that Fawad is probably going to discuss start to appear. Do I get a sidecar process to every application that I have so that they register themselves to some sort of centralized database? Do I use an external orchestrator so that basically every time that that orchestrator creates a new workload or a new backend, it tells the load balancer or whoever's brokering that there's a new backend? 
Do I use some sort of API gateway that will basically do the work for me? All these are options, and there are solutions following these options that we will follow in the, in the second part. Now we move forward in time, and instead of VMs, we started to use containers. Why do we use containers? Well, they're lightweight, they're faster to start and stop, they increase the workload density, they're very, very efficient. But what that means is they can start that stop in milliseconds. They're very, very fast. So what that means is now it's totally impossible to do anything manual, and if it's automatic, it has to be really, really efficient to cope with, with the churn in the service. So this is where we stand today. I'm probably just using my phone to access most of the applications. My friendly network provider is probably now a, a mobile network provider. And now my workloads are living anywhere where I need them to, to live. They can be in my data center, they can be in Amazon, they can be in Google, they can be in Azure. I'm probably orchestrating my applications in some sort of container orchestration platform, either Mesos or DCOS, either Docker, either Kubernetes, something like that. And these things have been created and destroyed in milliseconds. And I don't even know how many of them have been created and destroyed. So doing this manually, it's just impossible, right? So it's, these endpoints have been created in orders of magnitude faster than when they were VMs. And it's impossible to have uh, anything manual. We need some sort of automated discovery, which is probably doing the same thing that we did as network engineers 10 years back. It's basically registering all the backends when they come up and offering new services in the front end as they, as they become available. The options to do this are pretty much the same that we had with VMs. Is do we do sidecar processes? Do we do centralized orchestration? Do we do client server discovery? So now, when we have containers, the microservice paradigm comes in, right? Some of you may have heard of this thing called the monolith. And what is the monolith? The monolith is basically the fact that when we add in uh, code to our application, to our centralized application, typically it becomes a single unified code base and it tends to grow over time, and nobody knows who wrote that code, and when you need to patch it, or when you need to grow it, it becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult. It's difficult to maintain, it's difficult to troubleshoot, it's difficult to evolve. So in this 3 application, that thing in the middle tends to grow a lot, it tends to grow and become incredibly complex, incredibly hard to maintain. So what do we do with microservices? Basically divide and conquer. Let's say instead of maintaining this huge code base, let's divide the applications in functional areas, and then do different processes for them, then do different uh, functional specifications, and then interconnect them with REST APIs. So again, we're using networking for this. So we're not only interconnecting applications now, we're interconnecting pieces of applications. What that means is that probably, if, instead of having the monolith that we have on the left there, where the whole application was growing homogeneously and it had to be maintained as a single hold or a single uh, chunks, uh, chunk of code, we can divide them and make them in individual uh, little applications. They can scale individually, they can be developed individually, they can use different languages, they can do different infrastructures, different backends. So they're tiny little applications that will form uh, together a bigger application. Now what does that mean for what we're discussing today for service registration and service discovery? It means that they actually have the same problem in a much bigger magnitude. They need to discover each other, they need to know where the backends, where all these applications are living. So what you get is something like this. What you get is what you had before with much bigger complexity. And you, this may seem overly complex, but this is actually a simplified view. This view there is from a real customer that we have and those are the traffic patterns between a single application that they have on the microservices. When you start dividing and you get hooked into microservices and how they're simple, they have to evolve to scale, you need, to, you need something that provides that level of efficiency and that is able to create that, those many endpoints for all your backends. So to summarize on the history trip that in the time travel that we were saying, we started with something very simple on the left side. We had tens of services, we knew where they were, we could even configure manually load balancers because they were not changing that much. And now we have that thing on the right. And that thing on the right obviously can't be configured manually. So we need these tools to do this automatically and this is what we're going to discuss, how we do that. <coughs> so, for what? Thank you. Um, so we went over what microservices are and what problem they introduce with all the benefits that they have. So the problem is of course solvable and to solve this problem, um, the concepts of service registration and service discovery come into the picture. And I'm gonna talk about some of the patterns around service registration and discovery and a few of the tools. Um, these tools that I'm gonna talk about, they are worthy of a couple of hours of presentation each, so I'm not gonna go into too much details. It's gonna be very high level. 
um, and we have uh, not much time. So wherever um, we have different ways of doing something, um, you are given with choices, and you have to choose uh, which is the best way to go for you. You might have a very small, simple architecture, or you might have something very, very, which is supposed to scale a lot. Um, you might need to do it for a particular environment or the other one. Um, this is where you're given with different options. So let's, let's see what options are there for uh, service registration and discovery. Uh, there are patterns which exist um, in these, um, um, you know, um, uh, the way to solve the problem of uh, registration and discovery. Uh, what it means is that you, your microservices are coming up and down, and they get registered somewhere, and then at some point in time, or at the same point in time, somebody else are able to locate where those services or microservices are located. So uh, essentially what I'm trying to refer to is like a simple you know, naming service, as simple as that, but um, it's not as simple because you're moving towards these millions of endpoints and which are coming up and down as Fernando mentioned at you know, milliseconds even faster. Um, and every lifetime of these microservices uh, in some cases, it's less than 10 seconds. So um, in that case, these registration uh, techniques and discovery techniques uh, uh, vary and might you know, uh, be different for different use cases. So let's go over the first one. Uh, one way to do registration for services is to self-registration. What it means is that you have microservices which are running in a cluster, and um, as soon as they come up or they go down or they have a change of state, uh, they would go and talk to some registry, central registry somewhere which is running. Uh, it can be some database or anything, and they would you know, go and get updated. So you have a microservice interface with a service registry, and that's very, very simple. It doesn't seem very scalable, but yeah, if you have a very simple, simple thing uh, running your own cluster, you might want to use it. Um, the other way to do registration is third party. Uh, the, the application that you're defining doesn't really have to know about what your registry is, or doesn't need to have an interface with the registry. Uh, you give this job to some third-party tool. An example here would be, let's say you have uh, Marathon running applications with Mesos, and the applications don't have to talk to um, you know, your state of the cluster or anything. Your Marathon is responsible for managing it. In Docker, you have Docker Swarm or Docker. In uh, Kubernetes, you have Kubernetes take care of these things. So that's service manager over here points to some tool which knows about these microservices and goes and you know, updates their uh, service registry so that it has the updated state of the uh, microservices. Um, then let's move on to discovery. Uh, there are two ways to discover your applications once they are registered, either through client side or through uh, third party uh, registration. Uh, one, one way is to do is that your client needs to talk to your uh, microservices. Um, they would go to the registry themselves uh, directly, query where your microservices are located, and then uh, go through the API gateway or directly somehow to your microservices. So they would maybe through DNS or load balancer, as Fernando mentioned, um, or some other mechanism directly queuing the keys using HTTP or maybe some you know, uh, language binding, uh, whatever method, you know, service registry supports. Um, that's one way of doing it. Another mechanism is to do uh, server-side discovery where your client is agnostic. It doesn't really have to know um, what your service registry is, what interface is support, is it HTTP, is it some language binding, is it, is it something else? Uh, it just talks to its API gateway, which can be uh, you know, as simple as or as you know, common as a load balancer. Um, so you're, you're talking to a load balancer, which is automatically getting configured from your service discovery, or you know, getting a state from the service discovery, what members of the load balancer are supposed to be there, and then this load balancer or API gateway is taking you to your microservices. Um, Multiple ways of doing this and solving this uh, you know, problem of uh, registration and discovery or mechanism patterns. Um, um, now let's, let's, let's talk about the tools that we can apply these, um, these patterns to. And there are different tools out there. And there are a lot of those. I'm going to cover a few of those. Um, and I, very, very high level, of course. So it's kind of divided into uh, two categories. Um, one is there are tools which are like you know, key value distributed, um, key value um, stores or databases where you can store uh, state of your microservices and your query somehow using the interfaces that they expose. Uh, the other one is that which are designed uh, uh, particularly for microservices in a sense that they work with some solution like um, Docker or uh, DCOS or Mesos or Kubernetes. Uh, so let's start with Zookeeper. Um, it came up as part of the Hadoop project initially, and it uh, have many use cases. It does you know, configuration management, messaging queues, 
But the one which really is relevant to us is, is a naming service. You can you know, store information about your um, you know, microservices and then queue it some, using its interface. Um, that's the idea. The, the benefit that Zookeeper offers is that it's really uh, good on uh, providing consistency or you know, uh, making sure that data is you know, consistent across your cluster if you're running three nodes. Um, uh, however, it's, it seems and it's, it's not really, um, doesn't have all the features which are for uh, service discovery solutions uh, inherently as part of it. You have to do a lot of tooling around it uh, to get it uh, uh, to work. And uh, by tooling, what I mean is that, for example, in this diagram that you see here, you have a Zookeeper cluster running uh, and then some container hosts which are, um, you know, have containers running on them. These containers come up. They go and, let's say, as an example, they talk to Zookeeper to register their information, what their name is, what their IP port is. Um, and then you have this some read-write module um, over here, which is listening to Zookeeper events um, or you know, syncing up with Zookeeper uh, to configure a load balancer that your client can talk to uh, to get to your microservices. Uh, that's one way of using it. So Zookeeper is generic enough. It can be used for self-registration or third-party, both. It depends on how you use it. You can use it using for client-side registry uh, discovery or service-side discovery. Uh, again, depends on your use case. Um, it's a bit heavyweight for simple, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, simple um, ecosystems that if you want to build. Um, moving on, uh, we have HCD as well, very similar to Zookeeper. It was uh, um, used in some of the orchestration systems. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure we uh, all have heard about it so far. So um, it's a distributed key value store, very similar to Zookeeper. Um, the, the consensus algorithm that's used in uh, HCD is different from uh, uh, Zookeeper. Zookeeper uses um, Zookeeper Atomic Protocol, ZAB, um, and then uh, this um, uses, uh, HCD uses Raft. Um, the, 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 the benefit that HCD has over Zookeeper is it exposes an HTTP API interface, which is easier to consume using JSON, and it has some you know, security features like TLS, SSL. But in terms of use case, if you see, it looks exactly the same. Um, your client, your, your, your containers are coming up, getting registered with HCD. Um, then you have this module, this, there's, a, there's a module called Confi, which is capable of listening to Zookeep, uh, HCD events. Um, uh, and based on the events, it can um, you know, update some load balancer, let's say Nginx over here. And then you can, your client can talk to Nginx to get your microservices. Um, similar, very similar to Zookeeper in terms of you know, use case that it offers, very generic. Uh, therefore, storing the state of your uh, microservices. Um, then let's talk about console. Again, one of the solutions which came up um, has been there for some time. Um, primarily, it's a key value, distributed key value store. Um, also exposes HTTP interface. But the value add that it has, in addition to you know, Zookeeper and etcd, is it offers a built-in DNS server. So you are storing your information about your containers and their IPs, et cetera. So a DNS server, which is capable of serving SRV records, which means your microservices is IP and port information is explored as part of DNS SRV records. Um, that's something console is, you know, uh, as, as a value add in terms of uh, uh, service discovery. Uh, it also offers a bit of, you know, very simple load balancing. Um, and then uh, an additional thing that's built in into console is it can do health checks um, and monitoring a bit. So that's something is, is to, if you have a system which is already in DNS, standard, you know, um, uh, DNS-based system, you could just you know put console in it. You could be able to you would be able to use it, um, and then some security uh, aspects as well. You know, um, let's go to the next uh, group of service discovery tools. So the one we covered so far in the same category like distributed key value stores. Um, now we're going to some tools which are kind of they work in conjunction with uh, a full full solution. Um, let's say SkyDNS. Um, it's a, it's a service which serves you, um, provides you discovery of your microservices uh, when it works in conjunction with some key value store. Let's say in this case, HCD um, in this diagram that you have is um, one of the examples. Um, you have an adopter which listens to Docker events. It configures your HCD uh, for the information about your containers uh, that SkyDNS gets information from. And then your client can talk to SkyDNS to um, to, to locate where your microservices are. So that's one of the ways you can do it. So you can you know, also run it as part of Kubernetes. It's used over there, SkyDNS. Um, very similar to console in terms of DNS. Uh, however, it doesn't offer any health checks. Uh, let's move on. Um, Mesos DNS is 
another DNS-based solution. It works as part of uh, Mesos. Um, so the idea behind it is that this serves you um, location of the applications that you're running as part of Mesos um, over DNS, and it works. It, it syncs with uh, Mesos Master to get the state of your microservices, where they're running, what the location is, what their name is, and then your Mesos slave, which are running containers, can talk to uh, Mesos DNS to get the location of your microservices. Um, it also supports SRV records. The thing is, um, this is kind of a central DNS, and uh, Mesos work to uh, improve, or as part of the evolution, uh, a new um, project was introduced called Spartan as part of uh, DCOS. So this is responsible for um, doing distributed DNS. And the way it works is that it does dual dispatching of DNS queries to the backend, which are running multiple uh, masters of DCOS. And then whatever comes, query comes first, it's, you know, sends back to the client so that it, that's because there's no single point of failure. Uh, and then it's also it's a smart uh, way for it to figure out uh, where to route your traffic to, uh, queries to, um, in an optimal way, not to send to somebody which, which is way, way, way far. So that's, that's an uh, evolution of DNS inside the uh, Mesos ecosystem. Um, let's talk about uh, load balancer-based discovery. So um, in one of the examples, there are many out there, so is Marathon LB. Uh, so you have HAProxy, which is standard HAProxy, running in a container. And Marathon LB, what it does is that it talks to, it listens to Marathon events uh, to get information about your applications which are coming up and down as part of your, um, you know, definition of your whatever service that you define. And it goes and updates HA proxy uh, configuration using, you know, some templates. And this is a container which is running somewhere on your cluster, and your client will go and talk. This is good for northbound, uh, north-south traffic, but for east-west, this is, this is going to be a bit of uh, inefficient, uh, because if you have you know, hundreds or thousands of endpoints, um, uh, you might need something uh, distributed. So in terms of having a distributed you know, solution on service discovery, um, there's another one called Minuteman. It's also open source as part of uh, uh, DCOS. So this um, is very similar to how others work. Uh, this is responsible for listening to um, events from uh, DCOS, information getting over there as mesos, and um, the thing that works with that is responsible for doing everything that you saw with um, Marathon LB as running as a proxy. This guy is doing um, uh, using some kernel capabilities. It's doing uh, distributed way. Even if you're scaling your you know cluster to multiple you know way 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 more nodes, you're not uh, you know bound to any uh, you know um, uh, impact on latency uh, or throughput. It remains uh, you know uh, constant and consistent uh, as it would otherwise. Um, Let's, let's go to another solution, which is uh, called uh, SmartStack. So SmartStack has been there for a long time. It was um, introduced by Airbnb. And the idea was that to do service discovery for the applications that they were running, and they were probably VMs, and they could be containers, but primarily designed for VMs initially. Um, the way it works is that you have um, Zookeeper running, which is your service registry, the entire state is stored over here. Um, then you have every single host is running a process, a couple of processes called Nerve and Synapse. So Nerve is responsible for um, doing your service registry, and Synapse is, Synapse is responsible for doing service discovery and programming your HA proxy. So let's say you launch an application on one of the nodes, uh, Nerve would go and you know, program Zookeeper, Synapse would get information from Zookeeper, program HA proxy, then your application would talk to your local HA proxy to get to your uh, you know, member of your service, whichever you, that you want to get to. Um, again, one of the ways and to implement service registration discovery. Um, this is, these are not the only ones which are out there. In, in Kubernetes, you have kube proxy, which is a load balancer, which runs on every single uh, kube. Kubelet, um, it's a, uh, uses two modes, you have user mode and you know, uh, IP tables based mode. Um, again, you know, has information about uh, the services that it needs to get to as part of the ecosystem and gets over there. As part of Docker, there's an embedded DNS called Docker DNS, uh, Docker embedded DNS that you know, does um, DNS based discovery only for local networks which are out there, uh, not across this. So many, there are many solutions out there. We, we, um, could, give, we could keep going for days, literally. Yes, there, there, there are like several. So, Saying that, they are like, what are the key takeaways? Uh, we are, you know, talking about solutions and solutions and solutions. Um, uh, the key takeaways 
I would say that one size does not fit all, uh, and there are several, several out there. But what I can say, the advice that I can give you is uh, there are some parameters, there are some uh, things that whatever you're looking for, your own um, implementation is, is what matters to you. What kind of consistency are you looking for? Is it like, you know, want to make sure that it's, it's very strong consistency, it's eventually consistent? Uh, what kind of registration model makes sense for your solution? Is it, uh, you know, self or maybe third party automatic that you want to take care of those? And when you're doing maybe third, uh, third party registration, you want to make sure, you know, you have uh, not single process running for the entire cluster. You maybe want to have something which is, uh, you know, um, running in HA mode and, you know, doing lots of things over there. Um, you may, on discovery side, you want to choose between DNS versus load balancer, or you want to do client side, depends on uh, how it fits your needs. Um, then, of course, when you're talking about microservices, scale and performance is, is a very, very important factor. Um, and then the most important thing, which is, uh, you know, to take care of is uh, what environment are you running your system into? Is it, uh, you know, Mesos? Is it uh, Docker? Is it DCOS? Is it Kubernetes? Is it something else? So uh, whatever you need to pick has to work uh, with the system that you're trying to define. So with that, I'm going to move ahead to uh, the topic of uh, discovery and registration inside OpenStack. Um, is, it, is it needed here? Is it something, uh, is it even relevant to OpenStack? I would say yes, because containers are becoming first class citizens inside OpenStack now. Um, microservices uh, use cases are popping up over here. Uh, of course, in OpenStack, there are two ways to use OpenStack for containers. There's uh, infrastructure as a service, and then there are also use cases on platform as a service, uh, and there are users for uh, both the use cases. So given both the use cases, um, let's, let's talk about what are the facilitators that we have inside OpenStack uh, for microservices. Uh, we have Magnum, which is uh, providing container infrastructure management. You could you know, spin up your um, Mesos, Docker, Kubernetes uh, clusters on top of Nova VMs uh, using heat templates. Um, you have Kola, which allows you to deploy OpenStack. Um, then you have Murano for application catalog. And then you have Courier, which does networking for containers. So there are projects out there which are doing uh, things around containers. Um, somebody's doing networking, somebody's doing infrastructure. But we have several facilitators now, and they've been here for some time now. Um, what are the approaches that exist inside OpenStack um, for containers? There are two approaches. One is containers and the entire ecosystem around containers run on top of existing uh, you know, components of OpenStack. It's just that um, you, know, you buy Nova VMs, you do uh, Mesos on top of it, and, or something else, and you know, everything's running. So at that point, and you don't care if there's anything else that you need to take care of uh, from, you don't, you don't care about keys on authentication, you don't care about, um, uh, you need a network from Neutron, because that's, uh, you're running on top of uh, uh, this layer, and you don't, you're agnostic. That's one way of approach. The other way is, you have container ecosystem running over there as part of OpenStack, and it's partly managed by OpenStack as well, uh, where you have, uh, you wanna use Neutron, maybe. You wanna use something from Keystone or Nova, um, or maybe some other project. There are so many projects out there in OpenStack now. So there are two approaches, and these are the two only approaches that are there in OpenStack. Um, what is the current picture with these two approaches that we have in OpenStack now? Um, with approach one, we have you know, uh, Docker, uh, Mesos, DCOS, Kubernetes, uh, managed containers you can deploy on top of OpenStack you know, as VMs. Um, in this case, for service registration or discovery, OpenStack does not have to participate uh, or do anything for these components because they bring in all the uh, service registry and dis discovery components which exist already with them. They have been developed already, and they're, they're, they're pretty good in whatever they do already. Uh, maybe, be it Docker, be it Mesos, be it you know, uh, Kubernetes, so anything. Um, the other approach, we do not have off the shelf any solution today in OpenStack. Uh, there are projects, I mentioned the facilitators, but uh, to get an end-to-end -end solution, uh, how do we get there? So the, the ideology is that it boils down to just two things. You need to register your microservice and you need to be able to look up. Uh, the tools that we talked about kind of touch about, you know, you have load balancer, so you have Octavia somewhere, and OpenStack is a project. Um, you have designate for DNS, so yeah, if you wanna do DNS-based service discovery, sure. Um, you have courier over there, and Neutron uh, for networking for couriers, uh, net uh, containers. Uh, for, but specifically for service discovery and registration, maybe a new OpenStack project, maybe a courier can do it, uh, maybe something else, but 
this is something which doesn't exist today. So uh, this is the way would be the f desired state of the OpenStack ecosystem to achieve such a goal. And I believe that's one of the possible options uh, to get to uh, the use cases of uh, to solve the problem of this history and discovery inside uh, OpenStack. And this is where I leave you guys with this thought. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? It was quite a lot of information. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> uh, it's a question yes. there in the back. Yeah, uh, go ahead. If, if you can please come to the mic, that would be good. Yeah. Uh, I hope, is I'm there not a mic? sure we no. have a mic. Sure. Just speak loudly. <laughs> Oh, that, thanks. thanks. That, For that's example, cool. uh, uh, we can, have. Can, can you start over? Yeah, we already have some application running in our infrastructure, right? Now okay. we have to, you know, convert into microservices. Okay. So, what are the best practices, you know, for for architecting those part? Yeah, um, I I don't think we're discussing architectural design for microservices and how what are the patterns that you would divide your monolith into microservices by. As we were discussing, typically it's functional areas, and typically get people, uh, companies used to get people from different functional areas, areas because each microservice is an application in itself. So the way you do it, it's a pure mm, design decision that you have to make yourself, and it depends on how your application is designed today, how easy it is to divide, how clear the functional areas are, how your team is divided, can you create micro teams inside your team where you have someone from front end, someone from application, someone from back end, and you can put them together to work in the microservices themselves. So summarizing, I don't think there's a, there is a one size fits all. There's, there's no manual other than whatever fits you in your, depending on how your application is, is designed and how your team is designed, will probably will be the best option for you. Just as there is no right size for a microservice. As there is no right size for a container, right? We, some people do bigger containers and put many functions in there and most people try to do smaller containers with just a single processor or a couple of them. But I don't think there's a one size fits all and it depends on your particular use case. Start, start looking at, I would say, start looking at the solutions which exist already. Uh, you have many of those, so maybe one of those might resonate. In yeah. terms of what tools you should be using, I yes. thought the question was more on how do I divide my monolith into microservice? That was my answer. Now, in terms of what tools do you use once you know you want to move to microservices, I think we've seen many of them. Uh, obviously, some of them are more mature than others, but when the, the key to this talk was if you're going to containers, if you're going to microservices, if your services are being created and destroyed dynamically, you do need service registration and discovery. And it has to be fast and efficient and fully integrated with the rest of your stack. Otherwise, you're gonna have, you're gonna have a big task ahead of you. Okay. Yep. I'm surprised you didn't mention Spring Cloud, which is uh, developed by Netflix. And we, we are using it at work and it works pretty uh, good, so. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, again, uh, uh, Eureka is there, you know, this is there, so lots of tools are there, it's just that we mentioned a few of those because I had like a few we, minutes Again, to we, could, we could go all yes. day, literally, and there. I went back to 1980, and, and we could go all day just with the, with the options that came up in the last five years. I mean, Eureka is a great option, and Netflix has great solutions there. They're actually uh, doing a lot of great work on Mesos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, SmartStack, I think it was coming from Airbnb, yes. right? Yes. And they used to, some companies decided to yes. cook their own and then push it to the community. That's a great use case. I, this, again, as my first slide was saying, we're not trying to be a reference. That's what, yes. that's what. This they, is just awareness. Just to provide These tools overview. are not at all, I, I don't endorse any of those. So, you know, it's, I'm just talking about some of them, so, yeah. And, and be, try, try to be illustrative of the simpler way of doing things and the most complex way of doing things. But again, just the smart stack is a great combined solution. Uh, what you mentioned is also another great combined solution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? We have uh, one minute, probably. Perfect. Thank you for coming. Thanks, guys. everyone, Thank for you. your time. Bye.